Chapter 6. English Discoveries and Settlements. On the 5th of May, 1496, Henry VII, King of England, commissioned John Cabot of Venice to make discoveries in the Atlantic and Indian Oceans, to carry the English flag, and to take possession of all countries which he might discover. Cabot was a brave, adventurous man who had been a sailor from his boyhood, and was now a wealthy merchant of Bristol. Five ships were fitted out, and everything made ready for the voyage. In April 1497, the fleet left Bristol, and on the morning of the 24th of June, the gloomy shore of Labrador was seen. This was the real discovery of the American continent. Fourteen months elapsed before Columbus reached the coast of Guiana, and more than two years before Vespucci saw the mainland of South America. Cabot explored the coast of the country for several hundred miles. He supposed that the land was a part of the dominus of the Cham of Tartary. Interesting. But finding no inhabitants, he went on shore according to the terms of his commission, planted the flag of England, and took possession in the name of the English king. No man forgets his native land. By the side of the flag of his adopted country, Cabot set up the banner of the Republic of Venice, emblem of another flag which should one day float from sea to sea. As soon as he had satisfied himself of the extent of the country, Cabot sailed for England. On the homeward voyage, he twice saw the coast of Newfoundland, but made no landing. After an absence of three months, he reached Bristol and was greeted with enthusiasm. The town had holiday, and the people were wild about the great discovery. The king gave him money, new ships were fitted out, and a new commission was signed in February of 1498. But after the date of his patent, the name of John Cabot disappears from history. Where the rest of his life was passed and the circumstances of his death are unknown. Sebastian, son of John Cabot, inherited his father's genius. He had already been to the New World on the first voyage, and now he took up his father's work with all the fervor of youth. The very fleet which had been equipped for John Cabot was entrusted to Sebastian. The object had in view was the foolish project of discovering a northwest passage to the Indies. The voyage was made in the spring of 1498. Far to the north, the icebergs compelled Sebastian to change his course. It was July and the sun scarcely set at midnight. Seals were seen, and the ships plowed through such shoals of codfish as had never before been heard of. Labrador was disco again discovered. New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, and Maine were next explored. The whole coast of New England and the Middle States was now, for the first time since the days of the Norsemen, traced by Europeans. Nor did Cabot desist from this work, which was bestowing the title of discovery on the crown of England, until he reached Cape Hatteras. From that point, he began his homeward voyage. The future career of Cabot was a strange one. Henry VII, although quick to appreciate the value of Sebastian's discoveries, was slow to reward the discoverer. When the monarch died, the King of Spain enticed Cabot away from England and made him pilot major of the Spanish Navy. He lived to be very old but the circumstances of his death and his place of burial are unknown. The year 1498 is the most marked in the whole history of discovery. In the month of May, Vasco da Gama of Portugal doubled the Cape of Good Hope and succeeded in reaching Hindustan. During the summer of the younger, Cabot traced the Easter, eastern coast of North America through more than 20 degrees of latitude. In August, Columbus himself reached the mouth of the Orinoco. Of the three great discoveries, that of Cabot has proved to be by far the most important. The career of English discovery was checked during the greater part of the 16th century. In 1493, Pope Alexander drew an imaginary line 300 miles, of the, 300 miles west of the Azores and gave all islands and countries west of that line to Spain. Henry VII was a Catholic and did not care to have a conflict with his church by claiming the New World. His son and successor, Henry VIII, at first adopted the same policy. It was not until after the Reformation in England 
that the decision of the Pope came to be disregarded, and finally despised and laughed at. During the reign of Edward VI, the spirit of adventure was again aroused. In 1548, the King's Council gave Sebastian Cabot a hundred pounds to return from Spain and become Grand Pilot of England. The old admiral quitted Seville and once more sailed under the English flag. In the reign of Queen Mary, the power of England on the sea was not materially extended, but with the accession of Elizabeth, a new impulse was given to voyage and adventure. Martin Frobisher, aided by the Earl of Warwick, began anew the work of discovery. Three small vessels were fitted, were fitted out to sail in search of a northwest passage to Asia. One of the Frobisher's ship was lost on the voyage. Another returned to England. But the third sailed on until a higher latitude was reached than ever before on the American coast. The group of islands in the mouth of the Hudson Strait was discovered. The larger island lying northward was named Meta Incognita. In latitude 63 degrees and 8 minutes, Frobisher entered the strait which has ever since borne his name. He then sailed for England, carrying home with him an esquima and a stone said to contain gold. London was greatly excited. In May 1577, a new fleet departed for Meta Incognita to gather the precious metal. For weeks, the ships were in danger of being crushed among the icebergs. The summer was unfavorable. The vessels did not sail as far as Frobisher had done in a previous voyage. The mariners were alarmed at the perils around them and sought the first opportunity to get out of these dangerous seas and return to England. The English gold hunters were not yet satisfied. Fifteen new vessels were fitted out, the queen bearing part of the expense, and in the spring of 1578, a third voyage was begun. Three of the ships loaded with immigrants were to remain in the Promised Land. The other twelve were to be freighted with gold ore and returned to London. The vessels struggling through the icebergs finally reached Meta Incognita and took on cargoes of dirt. The provision ship slipped away and returned to England. Affairs grew desperate. The Northwest Passage was forgotten. The colony which was to be planted was no longer thought of. With several tons of spurious ore under the hatches, the ship set sail for home. The El Dorado of the Eskimo had proved a failure. In 1577, Sir Francis Drake sailed around the Pacific coast by the route which Magellan had discovered and became a terror to the Spanish vessels in those waters. Having thus enriched himself, he formed the project of tracing up the western coast of North America until he should find a northwest passage and then sail eastward around the continent. He proceeded northward as far as Oregon when his sailors, who had been for several years within the tropics, began to shiver with cold, and the enterprise was given up. Drake passed the winter of 1579-80 to 80 in a harbor on the coast of Mexico. To all that portion of America which he had thus explored, he gave the name of New Albion. But the English, came, the English claim thus established was of little value. Sir Humphrey Gilbert was perhaps the first to form a rational plan of colonization in America. His idea was to plant an agricultural and commercial state. He sought aid from the Queen and received a patent authorizing him to take possession of any 600 square miles of unoccupied territory in America and to establish a colony of which he would be proprietor and governor. Assisted by his illustrious half-brother, Walter Rayleigh, or Raleigh, Gilbert prepared five vessels and in the June of 1583 sailed for the west. The best ship in the fleet abandoned the rest and returned to Plymouth. In August, Gilbert reached Newfoundland and took possession of the country. Soon the sailors discovered some scales of mica, and a judge of metals declared the glittering mineral to be silver ore. The crews became insubordinate. Some went digging the supposed silver, while others gratified their piratical disposition by attacking the Spanish fishing ships in the neighboring harbors. Meanwhile, one of Gilbert's vessels became worthless and had to be abandoned. With the other three, he sailed toward the south. 
off the coast of Massachusetts, the largest of the ships was wrecked and a hundred sailors were drowned. Gilbert determined to return to England. The weather was stormy and the two ships now remained, now remaining were unfit for sea. The captain remained in the weaker vessel called the Squirrel, already shattered and ready to sink. As the ships were struggling through the sea at midnight, the Squirrel was suddenly engulfed. Not a man of the crew was saved. The other vessel finally reached Falmouth in safety. The project of colonization was next renewed by Raleigh. Raleigh. In the spring of 1584, he obtained a new patent as liberal as, as, liberal as Gilbert's. Raleigh was to become proprietor of a tract in America extending from the 33rd to the 40th parallel of latitude. This territory was to be peopled and organized into a state. The frozen north was now to be avoided, and the country of the Huguenots chosen as the seat of an empire. Two ships were fitted out, and the command given to Philip Amidas and Arthur Barlow. In July, the vessels reached Carolina. The sea was smooth and glassy. The woods were full of beauty and song. The natives were generous and hospitable. The shores of Albemarle and the Pamlico sounds were explored and the landing effected on Roanoke Island where the English were entertained by the Indian Queen. But neither Amidas or Barlow had the courage necessary to enterprise. After a stay of two months they returned to England, praising the beauties of the new land. Queen Elizabeth gave to her delightful country in the New World the name of Virginia. In December 1584, Sir Walter's patent was confirmed by Parliament the plan of colonization was undertaken with renewed zeal. The proprietor fitted out a second expedition and appointed Ralph Lane governor of the colony. Sir Richard Grenville commanded the fleet and a company partly comp composed of young nobles made up the crew. The fleet of seven vessels reached America on the 20th of June. At Cape Fear, they were in danger of being wrecked, but six days afterward, they reached Roanoke in safety. Here, Lane was left with a hundred and ten of the immigrants to form a settlement. Grenville returned to England, taking with him a Spanish treasure ship, which he had captured. Hostility soon broke out between the English and the Indians. When Gina, the king, and several of his chiefs were allured into the power of the English and murdered, hatred and gloom followed his deed, and the sense of danger became so great that when Sir Francis Drake came into the sight of the fleet, the colonists prevailed him, prevailed on him to carry them back to England. A few days afterward, a shipload of stores arrived from the prudent Raleigh, but finding no colony, the vessel sailed back to England. Soon Sir Richard Grainville came to Roanoke with three well-laden ships and made a fruitless search for the colonists. Not to lose possession of the country, he left fifteen men on the island and set sail for home. But another colony was easily made up, a charter of government was granted by the proprietor, John White, was chosen as governor and every care taken to secure the success of the city of Raleigh, soon to be founded in the West. In July, the immigrants arrived in Carolina. A search for the 15 men who had been left on Roanoke a year before revealed the fact that the natives had murdered them. Nevertheless, the northern extremity of the island was chosen as a site for the city and there were and there the foundations were laid. Disaster, disaster attended the enterprise. The Indians were still hostile. When peace was concluded, Sir Walter conferred on Montiel, one of the Indian chiefs, the title of Lord of Roanoke, a silly piece of business. The copper-colored noblemen could do nothing to aid the colonists. The fear of starvation soon compelled White to return to England for supplies. Had the settlers given themselves to tilling the toil and building houses, no further help would have been needed. The 18th of August was the birthday of Virginia, of Virginia Dare, the firstborn of the English children in the New World. When White set sail for England, he left behind a colony of 108 persons whose fate has never been ascertained. Raleigh soon sent out two supply ships to secure his starving colony but his efforts to reach them were unavailing. 
The vessels which he had sent with stores went cruising after Spanish merchantmen and were captured by a man of war. Not until 1590 did the governor return to search for the unfortunate colonists. The island was a desert. No soul remained to tell the story of the lost. Sir Walter, after spending $200,000 in the attempt to found a colony, gave up the enterprise. He assigned his rights to an association of London merchants, and it was under the authority that White made the final search for the settlers of Roanoke. From this time, very little in the way of discovery was accomplished by the English until 1602, when the work was renewed by Bartholomew Gosnold. Thus far, all the voyages to America had been by the way of Canary Islands and the West Indies. Abandoning this, past, this path, Gosnell, in a small vessel called the Concord, sailed directly across the Atlantic, and in seven weeks reached Maine. The distance thus gained was fully 2,000 miles. Explorations were made from Cape Elizabeth to Cape Cod. Here, the captain with four of his men went on shore. It was the first landing of Englishmen within the new limits of New England. On the most westerly of the Elizabeth Islands, the first New England settlement was begun. It was a short-lived enterprise. A traffic was opened with the natives, which resulted in loading the Concord with sassafras root. When the ship was about to depart for England, the settlers pleaded for permission to return with their friends. Gosnold acceded to their demands, and the island was abandoned. After a voyage of five weeks, the Concord reached home in safety. Gosnold gave glowing accounts of the country, and it was not long until another expedition to America was planned. Two vessels, the Speedwell and the Discoverer, composed the fleet with Martin Pring for commander. A cargo of merchandise was put on board, and in April 1603, the vessels sailed for America. They came safely to Penobscot Bay and spent some time in exploring the harbors of Maine. Pring sought the Sassafras region and loaded his vessels at Martha's Vineyard. Thence, he returned to England, reaching Bristol. After an absence of six months, that was the end of the sentence. <laughs> Two years later, George Weymouth made a voyage to America. He anchored among the islands of St. George on the, west, on the coast of Maine and explored the harbor. A trade was opened with the Indians, some of whom returned with Weymouth to England. The voyage homeward was safely made, the vessels reaching Plymouth in June. This was the last English expedition before the actual establishment of a colony in America. Recapitulation Henry VII commissions John Cabot, who discovers America, is recommissioned, Sebastian explores the American coast, becomes pilot of Spain. The year 1498, English discovery impeded, maritime enterprise under Elizabeth, Frobisher sails to America, returns to London, conducts a fleet to Meta Incognita, Sir Francis Drake goes to the Pacific coast, attempts to di the discovery of a Northwest Passage, Gilbert forms a plan of colonization, assisted by Raleigh, conducts a fleet to Newfoundland, the spurious minerals, Gilbert loses his ships and men, is lost at sea. Raleigh sends out Amidas and Barlow, they reach Roanoke, the place is abandoned. Raleigh sends a second colony, difficulties with the Indians. The colony is taken home by Drake, a new charter granted by Raleigh, immigrants arrive at Roanoke, a town is laid out, troubles with the Indians, Montio is a peer, White returns to England, the birth of Virginia Dare, the fate of the colony, Raleigh assigns his patent, Gosnold makes a direct voyage, attempts to form a settlement on Elizabeth Island, Gosnold trades with the natives, an expedition is sent out under Pring, he explores the New Eng England coast, Weymouth sails on a voyage, trades with the Indians, returns to England.